Bam, there we go. All right, all right. Hey, Shabbat Shalom, my beautiful family. This is your teacher, Eric. Let's try that one more time, shall we? Hey, get this one minute. There we go. You audio checks. All right, hey, so what? as I was saying, we've had a week full of Big ups, and then week a week full of some heartache as well. We lost someone who was very special to us, and that is Bob Kari, my wife's father. He was one of the the hardest working men that I've ever known, one of the most honest men that I've ever known, and he will be greatly missed. We were in the process, too, of ministering to him about the truth of the Bible that we've all been lied to because we have so many of us that have loved ones that they try as hard as they can to serve the king, but they've been deceived out there through this delusion, through this doctrine that it makes you drunk. When you read the word, it becomes hard to understand and to comprehend. A lot of us have been there. And so we were working with him and in, in helping him. And so here's the way I am with situations like this. Um, some people try to defend people that they love when they serve the king where they're at in their servitude. You know, oh, it's okay for them to transgress in this area and that area and, and try to make light of it. It actually makes me angry at the lies that Satan put out there. So that when you have good men like Bob, your grandfather, your father, that pick up the Bible and they're reading it, but then they have pastors that cleave more to man-made doctrines and traditions than they do the truth, and then they deceive the people. I don't know about you out there, but that makes me angry and it makes me want to be even more on fire. And I know that none of us are without sin. None of us are. So then where do we point the finger? Because see, that was the Pharisee attitude. Oh, this person didn't do this and they didn't do that. But I do all those things according to Torah. So I'm going to have a better place or I'm going into the kingdom and they're not. And that, is that what Yeshua said to do? No, he says, be concerned about yourself. Get yourself right so that you can lend a helping hand to your brother. We just read that about Peter, that Yeshua prayed over Peter that Satan would not take him. Now, Satan used him, manipulated him, got Peter to do his bidding even. But Yeshua prayed, I pray though that Satan does not have you and take you because then you will overcome and then boy, what a testimony you'll have to share. Is that beautiful or what? So I see that we have a lot of the beloved uh, saints in the house Brother Paul, hey, Shabbat Shalom, Yah, speed. Much love, Shabbat Shalom. I pray that the Holy Spirit absolutely has his way. Uh, Sabbath peace, hey, bless you, Sister Hannah, much love. Combat G, much love to you, hallelujah. My condolences, thank you, Sister Angela. I really appreciate that. And thank you for all your support that you contribute to our family and the work that we have to do. Thank you so much. Brother William, hey, Shabbat Shalom, my beautiful family. Now, I'm going to get this right today. Mrs., right, Mrs. Shack, our sister. I always say Mr. Shack. So, hey, our beautiful sister, much love, and thank you that your prayers are with our family. I really do um, appreciate that very much. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. All right, let's get right into it then, and we're going to kick off. So we will go with the Ten Commandments. Right, is that for you today? Not today? A little bit? Okay, I can do that. I can handle it. All right. I am Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim that brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of slavery. Thou shalt have no other Elohims before me, and thou shalt make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that's in the heaven above, the earth beneath, or the water that is under the earth. Thou shalt bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, Yahweh Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the iniquity of the Father upon the children, and to the third and fourth generation of those that hate me, and showing mercy to the thousands of them that love me and guard my commandments. Thou shalt take the name of Yahweh Elohim in vain, for Yahweh will not hold him guiltless to take his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For six days shall thy labor and do thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh Elohim, and in it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days Yahweh created the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that the days may be long upon the land, which Yahweh the Elohim giveth thee. Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Hallelujah. Father, 
Uh, we just come before you today. We're so thankful to be here in your presence and to allow your Ruach, your Holy Spirit, to have his way with us, that you minister through us as we go through the history of Yeshua HaMashiach and what he did for us, that you manifest what he did in our lives, that it's not a story or historical account, but it's something that's a reality each and every day in every waking moment. In the name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, I pray, so be it. Hallelujah. And for the brothers and sisters that we have lost and are no longer with us, but we know that we're with the king. Hallelujah. All right. Okay, family. So, hey, last week we were talking about Yeshua HaMashiach and how he went and had a meal with his brothers, right? His disciples that he was sending out on a mission. It was like the meal that was going to be done in memory of Yeshua and what he did. Now, it wasn't the Passover meal, as we clearly had seen last week, because it had been on the 13th day going into the sunset so then into the 14th day at evening, because it begins with the evening and then goes to the morning. So it was the very beginning of the 14th day. And they were doing this preparatory meal to prep for the Passover. But Yeshua said, I will not eat of this until I am in the kingdom. And I will not drink of this cup again until I'm in the kingdom, right? Now, the Passover meal was something done in remembrance of Israel coming out of captivity of the bondage of Egypt, a war of the Elohim showing that Yahweh, Yahweh was greater than these other fallen angels that had taken over other providences and gained the worship of the people. And they began to boast themselves against Israel and Yahweh needed to show all heaven and earth and all creation, I am the greatest. I am supreme. I'm the creator of the heavens and the earth. Heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. And so they had this remembrance meal that every year they would eat and they would talk about the time that their forefathers came out of Mitzrayim and they went through the wilderness as they traveled through the providences and the geographical grounds of dominion of these other Elohims. But wherever the tabernacle moved, the spirit of Yahweh rested right between the cherubim. And then that ground became holy ground in the midst of all the chaos, such as Eden, Eden was a land that Yahweh had fellowship with us in. And what surrounded it? The waters of chaos where men could not survive, but he created an island. All this land, and in that land, a garden. And the intention was is that we would spread and populate the earth and have ownership of all the heaven and the earth. And he attempted that again, even after we failed through Adam and Eve. Yahweh attempted again with the land of Canaan, the promised land that we would take that over, it'd be a restoration of Eden, and that it would grow and take over all the earth. And in the beginning of this, when we came out of the Exodus, we would have this meal, and every year we would remember what Yahweh did for us. Every year we would remember that the blood saved us from death. Every year. But when Yeshua was talking about this meal that was going to take place, and he gave us the guidelines and the schematics to celebrate the Passover from here on out, what's it in memory of? His body. Not the physical lamb, but the lamb of Elohim that the physical lamb pointed to. His blood. And that when we would eat this meal every single year, now it would be remembrance of his freedom that he gave us and set us free from Hasatan and these enemy forces that had death for us. But he gave us victory and death passed over us because of the blood of Yeshua on us. It was such a beautiful memorial and how we can go th through this today and have this meal and remember Yeshua, the lamb of Elohim. Remember the times that we came out of, out of Exodus, but to know this, that the new Exodus the Exodus that Yah has his plan where he's going to gather his people from the four corners of the earth. And you know who you are. You're the people out there that your hearts are being stirred for Yahweh right now. 
They're being stirred wherever you are, whatever color of skin that you have, whatever geographical location that you're in, Yahweh's working with you and his sheep will hear his voice and he's calling you out. And it said that this second exodus will be so great that the first one would not even be remembered. <laughs> That's pretty amazing when you look at all the miracles and the signs and the wonders in which he brought Israel out with the first one, how unbelievably great those were and how he made a spoil of those Elohims. And the heathen, wait till you see the next one. The spoil he's going to make of the Elohims that think they have rule of this earth, the ones that warred against Yeshua and the war that he came to teach us and how to fight and to send us on the battle. And so we read all of this. We saw that Yeshua, then when he went out from this meal, then he went to the Mount of Olives. And what I thought was so beautiful about that is the Mount of Olives is located on the eastern border of Jerusalem. And it's known for all its olive trees. It's also called the mountain of anointment. And this is because that the olives that are pressed from those trees on the Mount of Olives were used to ordain kings. Pretty special, right? The king of kings is there. And the trees that he is around was the oil that comes from them was to ordain the kings of Israel. Now, another interesting part is that King David was rejected as king by his own people because this revolt was led by Absalom, his own son. So his own people rejected King David because the people lost their faith in him. So what did David do? Well, he crossed over the Kidron Valley to arrive at the Mount of Olives to weep and to mourn his betrayal and his own sinfulness. So isn't it not fitting that the son of David, the king of kings, would kneel in the same location as David, being rejected by his people because of what? Their lack of faith. And as he's underneath these olive trees at Gethsemane, right before his betrayal by his own taught one, in which he was a father figure too, Judas. David goes because Absalom, his son, betrayed him, whom he was the father. Yeshua was a father figure to Judas. Judas betrays him at this location with a kiss. And then the others begin to lose heart as well. We saw that, right? When they're sitting off praying and Mary comes to the tomb and witnesses his resurrection and goes back to report, come, come check it out. So they all left. Well, as David returned over Jerusalem to take his rightful place, Yeshua will return here at the Mount of Olives again to be set as king over all the earth, according to Zechariah chapter 14, verses 4 through 9. It's just a beautiful, beautiful story, Israel. Now let's pick up where we left off. Because at this point, Yeshua had told Peter, hey, you're going to be used by Satan, but I pray that Satan will not take you so you'll have a testimony to tell us all about when you return in your strength. So did Peter end up denying Yeshua like was prophesied? Let's see. I think a lot of us know the answer to that. And it says, they seized him and led him away, that's Yeshua, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, this man was also with him. So in this situation, you have Yeshua over, being mocked and ridiculed and stricken by these priests and these rulers. But Peter can see all this taking place because it's done out in the open at this point. And it says, the servant girl goes, this man, Peter was with Yeshua, but Peter denied it saying, woman, I do not know Yeshua. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. Because what's going to happen to Peter if he says that he's with Yeshua? He's going to get killed. He's going to be 
thrown right in and the things he's seen done to Yeshua is going to be the very thing that happens to him. And should we not marvel when the world treated Yeshua and those that say that they love the Torah and they love the prophets the way that they treated the prophets in Yeshua? They murdered them. So what are they going to do with you? Well, if they can't physically murder you, they're going to murder your reputation. They're going to mock you and make fun of you. Call you a Cretan, right? Christianos, the follower of the Messiah, the follower of the Christ. Because that was a byword back then. You're a Neanderthal. You're a knucklehead. You were what they would call retarded in your mind. You were crude in your thinking, a Cretan, if you followed the teachings of Yeshua. So after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted saying, certainly this man also was with him for he too is a Galilean. So they could tell by the way you looked and the way that you spoke and dressed what providence you were from. And they knew that he was from Galilee. And a lot of the Israelites there around Judea, Jerusalem, they didn't like the Galileans. I went on that when we first started in Luke and taught you all about their disdain for the Galilean people. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately why he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And the master turned and looked at Peter. Boy, that'd be heartbreak, wouldn't it? Because Yeshua's right there. And Peter's right there in the courtyard. And when Peter did this denial three times, Yeshua turned and looked at him. And Peter remembered the saying of the master, how he said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. How many of us let Yeshua down? And it breaks our heart. And we weep bitterly. And when we feel Yeshua looking on us, the rebuke of his Holy Spirit, it cuts us right to our heart. Well, should we go off and just weep and stay weeping and just say, I'm a failure, I can't do this? No, you got to do like Peter did. Mourn, but then get suited up and ready for battle. And Peter comes out even more on fire for the Most High Yah than he had ever been. We see that he's the one of the ones right there, the one at the Council of, or not the Council of Jerusalem, but when the Holy Spirit touched down in Jerusalem, that he declared what the Holy Spirit was saying to all the people with all confidence right there at the temple, showing his change and now how he's a stronger witness, just like Yeshua said he would be. Peter, you'll deny me, but you'll come back stronger. Now the men who were holding Yeshua in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, prophesy, who is that that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. Now, when day came, so that would have been at the the evening time, right? Because it was still dark out on the 14th day. This is the preparation day of the Passover. And now it becomes early morning on the 14th day of the first month, right? Now, when the month of Nisan, when the day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led Yeshua away to their council. And they said, if you are the Messiah, Tell us. But Yeshua said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. Don't cast their pearls before swine, right? You don't always have to answer people every time that they have an accusation against you. Okay? Yeshua teaches us that. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of Elohim. So they all said, are you the son of Elohim then? And he said to them, you say that I am. Then they said, what further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. Now let me take you just a little bit further in all of this, okay? For this, I'm gonna go over to Matthew, the same account in chapter 26, all right? Let's read this. I'm gonna put full screen, there we go. Now the chief priest and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Yeshua that they might put him to death. Well, now we can see what kind of spirits in operation that they want false testimony. Their hearts were utterly wicked. There's no doubt that they were being used by Satan. All right? 
And false testimony can even be just one witness, not having two witnesses. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of Elohim and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is that that these men testify against you? Now, we know that the situation here is that Yeshua spoke of his body being the temple of the Most High Yah, and that his body would be destroyed and he'd be resurrected in three days. And thereby, we can die in Messiah and resurrect a new, new creature as well and become a temple as well for the indwelling of the Ruach. And also it was dual fold because the temple in 70 AD was destroyed and not one stone was left upon another. But that hadn't occurred yet. But he spoke in spiritual matters that they could not perceive. Again, Yeshua will not cast his pearls before swine in this matter. Verse 63, but Yeshua remained silent and the high priest said to him, I adore you by the living Elohim. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the son of Elohim. Now, this is what I really want you to, to catch here. Yeshua said to him, you have said also, or you have said so. But I tell you from now on, will, will you see the son of man seated at the right hand of power? But this is what's added in Matthew at the coming on the clouds of heaven. Now we know Yeshua and Luke also said that he would be in the clouds of heaven, commanding the angels. And to read on, the high priest tore his robes at this and said, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, he deserves death. Now, why would the high priest tear his clothes at the saying, you'll see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Because the clouds of heaven was a terminology given only to a deity, not a man, not a prophet. Yeshua said that the disciples would judge over the 12 tribes of Israel. It wasn't just that he said he'd be seated at the right hand of Yah, but he actually declared that he was Yah because he said that he would be coming in the clouds of heaven. Men don't come in the clouds of heaven. Only deities do. And this was well known throughout the Hebrew culture. This is called and known as cloud rider. Daniel 7, 13 and 14, which takes off of the Baal cycle, a Eurogetic text to mock the Baal cycle. I'll break this down in a later teaching. But it says here, I, I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. Let me take you over here and read Psalms 104 verses one through four. Bless Yahweh, O my soul. O Yahweh, my Elohim, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers the winds, his, mess, his ministers a flaming fire. Daniel was in the captivity of Babylon, all right? Here we have a Psalm of David referencing Yahweh being in the clouds as well. Now, Daniel being in Babylon would have learned of the Babylonian customs. And what was one of the Elohims, if not the main Elohim of Babylon? Baal. Baal. So it is of significance when we discovered the Baal cycle in Mesopotamia in a place called Uruget in the 20th century. It was in 1920 that we discovered these ancient writings of the Mesopotamian people. 
and their worship of their Elohim. It has flood story. It has the messengers, how they came down and taught man the ways of the angels. But in Mesopotamia, they thought the teachings of the ways of the angels was a, a glory, a benefit. It's how Babylon became the head city of all the cities on earth. But when the Israelite people write of the same event, they said, this was our destruction. This was our, our downfall in the book of Enoch. It's what took us away. So these people wanted to worship the Elohims that defected away from Yahweh, these fallen angels. They wanted to worship them and to gain their knowledge and strength. But the people of Yahweh said, no, we cling to Yahweh, not these fallen mighty ones. They are lesser for our Elohim created your Elohim. All right. So when we read of their text, what do we read about Baal? We read that Baal was known as the cloud rider. So Daniel's going to address this and he's going to say, no, Yahweh is the cloud rider. And the son of man that's coming, that is his manifestation in the flesh he will ride in the clouds for he is also deity. I'm teaching you something that you can use to show people that even our Hebrew Israelites, they keep Torah and claim faith in Yeshua. They say Yeshua was only a prophet. And they stumble at things like Yeshua praying to Yahweh in the Garden of Gethsemane, saying that, you know, Yahweh, if it, remove this cup from me if it's at all means possible, but nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done, Yahweh, Father. Or Yeshua telling his taught ones, it's not even the knowledge of the Son of Man that knows the times of the return. And so they're like, well, how can Yeshua be Yah? Because Yah made himself a little lower, lower than the angels. Yahweh divested himself of all his deity to remove excuses from us so he could live life as a human and do Perfectly what he asked us to do and we repeatedly failed at. He's to be the perfect example. So like I tell my children a lot, hey, this is the book and Yeshua is the, the movie, right? Yeshua is the DVD. Some people don't like to read instructions. They like to watch YouTube videos to show them how to do things. Watch Yeshua, watch his manner of life. He shows you how to do this, right? So when we read these texts, we know that both the Hebrew Bible and the Eurogetic text of Mesopotamia describe Yahweh in the Hebrew Bible and Baal in the Eurogetic Bible as the rider of the clouds. The mythopoetical motif of cloud riding can be seen in many ancient Near Eastern texts where a storm Elohim races through the heavens on his or her angelic cloud chariot. This is true also of the portions of the Hebrew Bible that describe Yahweh as one who makes the clouds his chariot and who walks on the wings of the wind, Psalms 104.3. Since, since Yurigit is, in literature, Israel's most significant Canaanite neighbor, it becomes a matter of interest when the Baal is repeatedly called the writer of the clouds in his respective text. And so at this, when Yeshua said, bring you back over to this, oh, I had that in Matthew, that's right. You have, said also, you have said so, but I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now we know why the high priest would immediately tear his robes and say he uttered blasphemy because Yeshua at that declared himself deity. The layman doesn't know, but believe me, the scribes know. Many times when Yeshua said before Abraham, I am which is the name of Yahweh, Yahweh, I am that I am. And being before Abraham when he was old, not even 50, Yeshua was in his 30s. They knew he was claiming deity at that point as well. And what did they do? They wanted to stone him. So it's remarkable and amazing at the ones who haven't studied this thoroughly that trip up on the surface that Yeshua was only a prophet and he was actually born of Joseph. Untrue. Yeshua was born of the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, and formed in the womb of Mary, such as Adam, 
The first Adam was formed in the womb of the earth the same way. Yah was stirred to dust of the earth and he was formed there without a navel, without a birth mother, without a father, an earthly father. Yeshua, the womb was stirred and we are but dust, right? We come from the dust and the womb of Mary was stirred as the Ruach, the second Adam formed in her womb. It's a beautiful, beautiful account. Let's go back here. Going over to Luke 23. It says, then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. So we have the council that are now going to bring Yeshua before Pilate. And the reason is, is that the council said, hey, you're worthy of death now. We've had our adjudication in which they did not have proper witnesses. So they did it on a false testimony and they killed him because of, or they murdered him because of their envy. But now that they have made up their minds to do so, they have to take him to the Roman officials because they're under Roman occupation. So they cannot carry out a death sentence unless Rome signs off on it. All right. They're only allotted so many freedoms. So this is why they now that they've had their false adjudication. And I could go through so much more detail. It wasn't even held in the proper location. It wasn't held by the proper councils of elders. The Sanhedrin were not part of this adjudication. Go search that out. The Sanhedrin were not a part of this adjudication as which they should have been on a matter concerning death. Okay. The, and a matter of false prophet is what they had him at. Okay. This would be someone that was causing a, a rebel rouser for even Rome that they accused Yeshua of. He's going to cause a riot that could end up upsetting the order of Rome. And then also he speaks against our doctrine, can claim, um, does many signs and wonders in front of the people and leads people out of the way of Torah and proclaims his own deity. Well, they knew a Messiah was coming. They knew the Messiah would do signs and wonders. So they should have adjudicated, does he fit all the guidelines to being the Messiah? And they didn't do that. They just skipped over all of that. And they said he was a blasphemer and he was a false prophet doing signs and wonders to lead people out of the way. Sanhedrin did not govern this. It was not done at the proper location in front of the right adjudication. Now he's taken over to Pilate, right? And then we're going to start here. The whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar. All faults. He actually said, render unto Caesar. What is Caesar's? Did he not? And saying that he himself is Christ, Messiah, a king. Now they're throwing that little thing in there because you have Herod, Herod the Great, who is an Edomite, put up as a puppet king. And I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but this is why the people really wanted to usher in the Messiah. Because they had a king that came from Eden, who was, Edom was forced into conversion. I'll give you a little bit of a background because you know that es Esau is where the Edomites came from, right? And Esau was at war with Israel. They forbid Israel to get a drink and to get sustained as they pass through their land. And so Yahweh brought a heavy judgment upon them for, for that. And he says, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. But we know that the Israelites intermingled with Esau, with the Edomites. Because even in our laws, it says that up until the fourth generation, one cannot sit on the council of the Israelites, not just become into the congregation of Israel, but on the authority of seat of Israel under the leadership status for four generations. Now, some would argue, is this only for the female or is this only for the male? But we can see that primarily this would have been speaking of males because those were the ones in leadership positions. And if you had an Edomite that was a male, the son or daughters would be also bloodline Edomites. If you had an Edomite that was a woman the son, and, the, and the man was an Israelite, the sons and daughters would be Israelite bloodline and stock. So the kingdom of Edom came under the, the southern kingdom of Judah and he began to integrate in to Judah. And this is what we have at the time when Yeshua came, this process. 
Now, King Herod the first, called Herod the Great, he was an Edomite. And the Roman council, Tiberius and Pilate, mainly Tiberius, said, we're going to put Herod up as king over the Jews. And that's the one that made Herod's temple and everything like that. Now, he passed on before Yeshua even came. And his sons, who we hear about, who also claims the name of Herod, such as we see Julius Caesar, but then the Caesars after that, claiming that title. So Herod is more of a title than a proper name. So people get confused when Herod's mentioned often in the Bible, well, which Herod are we talking about? Okay, because Herod Antipas is the one that murdered John the Baptist. Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, is the one that also brought Yeshua before him and the one that Yeshua was taken to, all right? Now, the people of Israel, they know that the king has to come from which tribe? The tribe of Judah. So they have a puppet king put over them by force from Esau, Edom, one that's not even of the 12 tribes. So you can see the upset, the anger. It's not even in the fourth generation, and you're already ruling over us. You are a mamzer, a bastard, Herod. You're not to sit on the council of, of Israel and rule us, and then your son rules us. Anger. So this was part of the, 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 the other, I would say, it's not complex, but complexity of the reign of Yeshua, of why they were so upset when he came back out to be put to the stake. And they're like, you're supposed to be our king, the rightful king, the king of Judah. And not only that, the king of kings, our Messiah. But he goes, I am all those things. Let Herod, the puppet foreigner, the mamzer, let him be the king over earthly Israel. I'm the king over kings over heavenly Israel, over the heavenly kingdom. So now we're getting kind of the layout here. So I wanted to bring you all into that and then bring you back in. And we're going to make it all make sense by the end of it. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priest and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea and Galilee, even to this place. And that stir up actually is more than just stirring. It's actually causing a riot, is what they were insinuating. That Yeshua is causing such a riot that he may raise up an army to go and overthrow Rome. Let me give you a little bit more background. Why is Pilate even there? This isn't where Pilate lives. Why was he there? Because of Passover. Well, why would a Roman official be at Passover and make sure that he was there? Because thousands and thousands and thousands of Israelites, of Hebrews, came in for Passover because it was one of the appointed feasts that was commanded to go to the temple. And so there would be thousands of people rolling in. This is the prep day, the 14th day in the morning. Thousands of people are rolling in for this feast. They go to Pilate and say, this man is stirring up the people. He may cause a riot. Pilate is there as a symbol of control. That's why Rome sends him there for the feast days, the three feasts. He's there for a form of control, a symbol of the Roman government. And they would bring in more guards and everything else and pile them on during these feast days. You see this even in, a, in the, like where you're scattered at today where they have big functions and big gatherings and they bring in security. And if you have someone that's really motivational and a, and a big driver, a big speaker, and maybe a little bit radical, they bring in extra security, right? Extra police and everything to make sure the people don't get too wound up. Okay? So this is why Pilate was, was there. And so this is a perfect scheme for the Jew, these, these Jews, these leaders to do to Yeshua. It's all planned out. This is all plotted the whole thing. And so this is why Pilate really, really is concerned about this because so many people say, oh, Pilate just murdered this guy. No, Pilate had a reason to be concerned at this point, okay? Let's go and see a little bit more. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod. Now this is Herod 
Antipas, not Herod that built, you know, reformed the temple and called it Herod's temple. That Herod's already passed on. This is his son. He sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. Why? He didn't live there, but it was because of the feast. This is how come Yeshua can make all these council meetings and these adjudications in one day and still have time to get put on the stake and taken down before the sunset going into Passover because Passover has not yet occurred. But everybody was in walking distance of each other, okay? Now, when, now he sends them over to Herod. Now, I want to give you a little bit more of this information because you would say, well, let's, let's go there. Let's go here. I'm just going to go here. I, I've already told you about Herod being the Edomite. We've kind of went into that. And, and that's enough of that. Now, when he learned that Herod, that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who himself was in Jerusalem at that time. And when Herod saw Yeshua, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priest and scribe stood by, vehemently accusing him. And Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him, then saying, then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. Key moment right here. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before this, they had been at hatred with each other. Now, with that, you could ask, how would Luke know? How would Luke know that they were at hatred with each other? And this is key in comprehending this whole thing, just like I said, that with all the Israelites coming in, that they would bring in Roman officials to help keep the people calm down so a revolt wouldn't rise. So when Yeshua was accused of a revolt or stirring revolt, it was going to be very concerning for the Roman officials. And then the other part of this is, is that Pilate and Herod didn't get along, as we saw here. And so Pilate wants to make sure all of this is done delicately, so he doesn't cause issues, any more issues with Herod. Because what Herod Antipas was doing was reporting over to Tiberius faults with Pilate. Pilate did this again. Pilate couldn't handle this again. Pilate's not doing a good job. So Pilate wasn't in good eyes with Tiberius. So Pilate had to make sure that he did the right thing. So Pilate knew, oh, you're a Galilean? Well, then that's Herod Antipas's jurisdiction. So I better make the peace and send you over to Antipas to be adjudicated as well, right? Also, Herod Antipas wanted Yeshua to be like this, if I can say this and be pure, a show pony, basically, for Herod, a jester, if you will. Oh, come do miracles, signs and wonders in my court. Like he was just a little, like I said, a jester, a joker, a little puppet. And Yeshua wasn't going to play their games. So when we went to the miracles and signs, Antipas became angry. But it, was a, it brought good relations that the one that Antipas wanted to see Yeshua all this time, that Pilate made that possible. That's what mended that relationship. So also, you could say, how did Luke know this? Well, I just want to give this to you, is that perhaps he had a source from within the court. Because we know according to Luke 8.3, when we read that, that Joanna, the wife of Herod steward, okay, the wife of Herod steward, she was out doing works with Messiah. Meaning when I say works, she was out helping and aiding the Messiah, aiding to his need, sustaining him, bringing him food, raiment, whatever he needed, tending to him. That's what she was doing. So she had an inner knowledge of the, of the courts of Pilate. We also see in Acts 13, verse 1, that a member of Herod's court afterwards became a follower of Messiah, and his name was Menaean. And he came over and converted, and Luke wrote Acts, so thereby Luke gained this knowledge of the inner workings of what was going on here. Because, again, these questions do get asked, so we're just putting it in proper order for everybody. Now, I'm going to go ahead and Read Luke 23, verse 13. It says that Pilate then called together the chief priest and the rulers and the people and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. 
Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. Now, I do want to show you some things, some pictures. So this is where I spoke of that Edom had went through the forest forced conversion by the Hasmoneans in the second century. And there's Edom at the southern base of Judah, and they began to intermingle, as you see that picture there. Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch of Galilee and Praria, there you can see that's his ruling. And we see the Shua is from Galilee. And there's his, his rule. And this is where the trial was held. This is the Patroium in Jerusalem. You know where it should have been actually held at the Hall of Hewn Stones but it wasn't held there. And that's where the Sanhedrin was. It was actually held over here at the Patronium, just to show you that. Okay. Now that we see that, I'll bring you back over into here. So Herod sent him back saying, look, there's nothing deserving to death that has been done by him. This guy's just some goofball, some radical. He's powerless. He can't do anything. I will therefore punish him and release him. Now, you can see here, it says in Luke 23, 17, it says foot, footnotes. And this is the English Standard Version. Because what was in some Greek manuscripts was now he was obliged to release one of the men to them at the festival. But that was added in. That was not something that was actually included in the manuscripts. And to make note of it, it's like I have taught to you all here, many times, like Jersey, London, Boston, Jackson, and Christy, like many times I had taught that the Bible, when we, we this wasn't just downloaded out of, out of heaven into the people. Yahweh used the man to deliver his message. And I find that more trustworthy. I would say I wouldn't really trust somebody that says they found some gold, golden tablets that's descended out of heaven today, Right? like we've seen with the Mormons and things like that. Yah just gave me this message. But there was multiple witnesses because you have men just go out singular, singularity and have these messages. Even Moshe that had received the tablets, there was many witnesses to it. As he began to write with his hand, Yah said in Exodus, write about these things that the Amalekites did and these people did write of these things. So Moshe is going to put it in his own words and write of the account that he experienced in his own words. His eyes didn't roll in the back of his head, and he began just to write like this. Moshe's like, I experienced this, Shah, and you put onto my heart to write this down. I'm going to write it down. That's what we even have with the Gospels. Luke writes his account, and here we can see, to give you a little bit more knowledge, because it's going to jump in from, therefore, right here, in the original manuscript, it would say, I will therefore punish him, release him, said Pilate. And then it would go down to verse 18. But they all cried together away with this man and release unto us Barabbas. Well, where did that come from? How, how all of a sudden did we jump into this Barabbas being released? An editor came in and he's like, I'm going to make this make sense. I'm going to write in here and create verse 17 and say that it was the custom for a man to be released at the time of the festivals. You get that? So he's just giving us a time frame here. Something that we commonly see in manuscripts. It's nothing to get alarmed about. It's still the inspired word of Yahweh, of Yahweh, okay? So that's what we see here. And I just wanted to explain that because believe you me, some people just go off on tangents and they use verses like this to say your Bible has been tampered with. You can't trust it. No, it's, it's simply just an editorial mark. And they were honorable enough when they did these editorials to make little insignias of theirs who was doing the editorial, who was doing the, the translation, they'd make a little insignia by where they would make this, this translation and when they would add this in. You know, we see it today a lot of times in italics, but sometimes, sometimes things fall out of italics, right, over many translations. And now you have to go back and do the research to find out what's included and what's not. So they all cried out together, saying, away with this man and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection and started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Yeshua, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. A third time, and that's significant in the Bible, many things are done in threes, 
You know, the cock crows three times. Peter denies Jesus, of course, three times. Um, Peter is told, or Peter has the, the veil that's dropped down and he has that vision with Yahweh. It's dropped down three times. Three Gentiles appear. So we see threes, 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 three days and three nights, right? Just continuously used throughout scripture. And it's a beautiful poetic thing that Yah does. And a third time he said to him, why, what evil has he done? I have found no, I found in him no guilt deserving death. I would therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided their demands should be granted. Now, with the demands being granted, well, we know that in other accounts of the gospel, that Pilate's wife, had a dream about Yeshua. And she came to Pilate and said, have nothing to do with this righteous man. Don't do anything, okay? And so when Pilate has a situation, uh, that's why I give you all the context. It's a time of Passover. Israelites flooding in. They already have, they want to keep things under control during this large gathering. You have a man accused of inciting riot among the people. You also have a relationship with Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, that he wants to, to restore. He just got done mending it by sending Yeshua there. He doesn't need it upset by having all the, these leaders go back to Herod Antipas and say, Pilate would not let us do according to our custom and put this man to death. Pilate let an unrighteous man live. And we're all witnesses that he declares himself deity and he's a false prophet and everything else. Pilate knows he's going to have trouble with Antipas then. Then he's going to have trouble with who? Tiberius. He doesn't want that. So when the cries escalate, Pilate tries three times to de-escalate the situation. And when he sees it's getting more excited and more excited and more, he's like, I'm going to create a riot right here if I don't get this thing settled. People are pouring into the city. I don't need problems, all right? So he takes water and symbolically washes his hands of it and said, the blood's not on me. And they took the blood upon them, the Jewish people did. They said, let the blood be on us and our children's children. Who slaughtered the Passover lamb? Was it Gentiles? Strangers? No, they weren't even being able to eat the Passover unless they became circumcised and became as one born in the land. Then they could eat of the Passover because they were no longer a stranger. The Houdim, the Israelite people, the, the own people slaughtered the lamb. Yeshua's own people, the Israelite people, slaughtered the lamb. They slaughtered him. They said, let the blood be on us and the children's children. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Yeshua over to their will. And as they led him away, they seized one, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country and laid him on the stake, stratos, cross, to carry it behind Yeshua. And you may ask, well, what's happening here? Well, the same thing that Peter knew would happen to him. Cyrene is an African city. So this man is, of, is African, right? Simon the Cyrenian, Simon the African father of Alexander and Rufus, who are actually mentioned in Mark 15, 21, or he's mentioned in Mark 15, 21, that he is the father of these. And Rufus's actions are mentioned, who is the son of Simon the Cyrenian, in Romans 16, 13, as a servant of Yeshua, along with his mother. So this man, Simon the Cyrene, and his wife are followers of Yeshua, and they raise their children to be followers of Yeshua. And it's a glorious thing to see that even in Acts chapter, or I mean in Romans 16, 13, that Rufus is still holding the faith. And so is his mother. Beautiful, right? Because they've seen what happened here. They, their father was charged to carry the stake. And it says here that who was coming in from the country and laid on him the stake to carry it behind Yeshua. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for Yeshua. But just a small remnant compared to everyone, right? The other ones were throwing rocks at him. And these people followed Yeshua through all of that. Through Yeshua being mocked, ridiculed, 
spit on, made fun of. I love that there was a small remnant that said, no, Yeshua, we'll pick up our stake like Simon the Cyrene. We'll follow you too, such as we do today. But turning to them, Yeshua said, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and breast that never nursed. They will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and the hills cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it's dry? Now, the beautiful thing about this or the, the humbling thing I should say about this is that we know from the ancient Israelite literature and the Bible that it was a, a curse, if you will. It was a bad name, a reproach among the people for a woman to be barren or to not give birth to a son, especially barrenness. Because you don't have male infertility ever mentioned in scripture. When the people are writing about this from their perspective, you don't see that mentioned. So they perceive that barrenness must be as a result of the woman, possibly something she had done that they're in displeasing to Yahweh or the household had done or a generational curse. So when the womb would become opened, they said, my reproach has been taken away. And Yeshua says here that there will come a day when blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Well, we see this spoken of in Deuteronomy 28, verse 53, where such judgment would come on the Israelite people for their disobedience, that mothers who are the first line protectors and guides to the children, right? And then you have the men, of course, that go off into the battle, but a, a woman has a children right by her side. The mama bear, right? She'll fight to the death for her children. It says that such calamity will come upon you that that which just comes natural as a nurturer, the mothers are just natural nurturers. You should be by nature. That you'll turn on your offspring and you'll murder them and eat them. This is said in Deuteronomy 28, verse 53. And this took place in 2 Kings chapter 6, 29, where they ate their children. Josephus, the book of wars, the Jewish wars, book six, speaks of Mary Bethzuba, who ate her child in the Roman war in 70 AD when Titus built a wall of men around Jerusalem and he allowed all the people to come in for the feast of Passover, but he wouldn't let anybody leave in 70 AD. So all the food got drained up and there was nothing to eat, starving the people out that they would come out and give up and become underneath Roman occupation. But they wouldn't give up and they kept fighting. So Josephus, when he's talking about this, said that a woman came of starvation and ate her own child. And when the people could smell the body roasting of the child, they're, what is that peculiar smell? And they came in searching. And when they found out this woman ate half of her child and hid the other half, it grieved them in their heart. It was so barbaric, it even grieved the Roman people, according to history, and even Titus, who when Titus said, I didn't want it to come to this. I did not want it to come to this. So Yeshua is prophesying of this that's going to take place in 70 AD. Of this, There'll come a time when you are starving here in this land, that's when you're really going to weep. That's when you're really going to be in sorrow. Because that's why Yeshua went up on the Mount of Olives because I had a beautiful view over Jerusalem. And he would weep over Jerusalem because he says, I can see the coming destruction. All right? Let's go back over. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, they were crucified with him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Now, let's see. I want to, we're going to go into this. I'm going to read this. I'm going to come back. So just remember this. Father, forgive them, Yeshua says, for 
They know not what they do. And some omit this, some transcripts and some add it. And what is omitted is the, and Yeshua says, and what they do. Okay. So it'd be father, forgive them. And they cast lots to divide his garments would have been in the original, but it was added father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments and the people stood by watching, but the ruler scoffed at him saying, he saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Messiah of Elohim, his chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him coming up and offering sour wine saying, if you are the King of the Hudim, save yourself. So the wine would have been, Vinegar, which would have been also used for medicinal purposes. So then comes in the argument, well, if these soldiers were mocking him, why would they touch the vinegar to his lips? Well, they did it in a mocking way. Heal yourself, Messiah. Here, put it on a, a sponge and put it up to his lips. Taste it. Taste it. Be healed. They didn't really care to heal him and help him. This was all a gesture and mocking of him. Right? It's like being up there on that stake and someone throwing a first aid kit to you or putting an ointment on your side or something. Here, be healed, Yeshua. Heal yourself. Put on bandages. Mocking, making fun of him. Now, I'm going to go through a few things. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews, the Hudim. And one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. So this criminal was mocking Yeshua once again, being mocked by one hanging on the stake, mocking Yeshua that was to his side, saying, well, if you are this chosen one, then save yourself. Oh, and save us, free us while you're at it. But the other rebuked him, rebuked the other criminal saying, do you not fear Elohim since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And indeed, justly, we, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Yeshua, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Yeshua said to him, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. So one man looked out in faith and said, you're going to face the same fate as Yeshua and you mock him? Do you not fear Elohim? Because you yourself will be before Elohim this day to be judged. And yet you have no fear that this man is righteous, that you could be wrong. That's what he's talking about. So I want you to stick with me. I'm really going to break something down for you. So let's back up just a little bit. And we see here that the criminals were to be put to death with him. Two criminals, Luke 23, 32. They go to the place that was the skull. Now I'm going to show you a couple things. These are possible candidates for the tree that these men were hung on, nailed to. We know that his hands had to be pierced, right? in his feet for our transgressions. The prophets speak of that. David does. So some say he was not pierced. He was only bound to the tree or he was hung by his neck on a tree. False. These are ones that don't believe the prophets. Now, like I showed you last week, that one, the third over, the cross, that's not it. They weren't taking these and erecting the full thing. And I, I found this through history that you would have the stratos, the upright beam, the first one right there that you see. And that the cross beam is something that would be brought in and placed on top and he would be hung up on. Some don't believe that he was on a cross beam at all. Some believe that he was just nailed into that one stake. Others believe that it was an actual tree growing from the ground that they would take and use to put people on. I go with that second one. You guys can make up your own decision and study history because it doesn't change anything. But what this was, was a pagan altar in the way that they would crucify these people under their pagan gods. Yet Yeshua, we will see that he defeats death and he destroys the altar of the pagan Elohims in this, right? So it's a beautiful thing. Now, again, we see them all along the roads here. This would be common. Many people were impelled. It wasn't something that was just done to one man. There's a side of that. 
We see that they have archaeological evidence from Roman times, from that centuries, of when they did these impalements, that they were nailed into the crossbeam. All right? So, I'm going to go over here. And show you this. Let's go to the skull, okay? Because the skull is the place where Yeshua was put to death. And I find this interesting because Genesis 3.15 reads, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring, the woman's offspring, speaking of Yeshua, and her offspring, speaking of Hasatan, and Yeshua shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his head. Heal. What's interesting about this is that we see the heel was bruised. It was not a stake. His feet were pierced in his hands for us. Also, the body in which Yahweh created that he walked the earth was bruised and beaten for our transgressions. The heel, the body in which Yeshua encapsulated and became the flesh suit was bruised, put to death, but death could not contain him for he resurrected. So did he defeat him? No. But Yeshua was taken to the place of the skull. They call this Calvary, which was a translation not quite proper in the Latin for Golgotha. It really should be translated skull, the head was bruised of Satan, the death place, the altar where it was erected to have Yeshua, the, the, the workers of, of iniquity, of lawlessness, took Yeshua doing the bidding of Satan, their master, to put him on that altar to be sacrificed to their gods, to be murdered, that they would defeat Satan, to, to defeat Yeshua, and that that not, did not take place. It actually accomplished the mission of Yeshua, and Yeshua bruised his head on the place of the skull. So I love this complete biblical narrative, the way that this is done. I want to give you one more here. Jump over here. All right. So let me know if I'm not coming in, because you should have me on camera now. Now, we know from the Bible, I have it. We know from, let's see, I want to get the right scripture here, that the goats will be placed on the left and the sheep on the right, according to scripture, right? That's Matthew 25, 33. That the goats would be on the left and the sheep on the right. So when you have these men that are brought in with Yeshua, and they're put on a stake, the upright beam. So there we have Yeshua, right? And we have to his left, the goat, and to his right, the lamb, or better worded, let's do it this way, sheep. Because in the center, we have the Lamb of Elohim, right? The judge. And we have one thief, or one transgressor, we'll put it like that, that is worthy of death, put on the stake beside him. And he says, oh, if you are the son of Elohim, then save us and save yourself ridiculing a goat, not one of Yeshua's. But on the right, we have a sheep. It says, do you not have fear of Elohim to mock this righteous man? He pleads over Yeshua to forgive him. And Yeshua says, I will see you in the kingdom. Because Yeshua knew that without this man being baptized in water, without this man yet even being baptized in fire, that through a confession of faith, 
that Yeshua is the living son of Elohim, the lamb sent. Through that confession, he is saved. Because Yeshua knew that if this man got down and walked off of that stake, he would be a servant of him and minister to his very last day. That he wouldn't have got down and ran back to his life of crying. Yeshua judges to the heart. That's why Yah's ways are higher than our ways. He is the one who decides. He is the one who judges. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but what image do we have here? Let me put it for you in a different way. There was a lampstand that was in the holy call, the tabernacle, that was a light. It gave light in there so they could see, right? That is also called a tree. Yeshua is the tree of life. That if you would eat of him, that you would never hunger again and you would have everlasting life, correct? Yeshua is also known as the light of this world. And he was here impaled for our transgressions. Beside him were two other men, the goat and the sheep, correct? We're just going to put him impaled with Yeshua. These are their hands that were up above their heads. You have the tree of life on the hill of the skull that was intended to be the hill of death. Hallelujah. It's a beautiful picture. Glory to the king. Let's keep on, keep on moving here. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So we got tens all around. That's that's. It's great. All right. So now going back into here, and it says that, let me grab my notes. I want to make sure I cover everything today. We were going to the university today, right? That's what we're doing today. So I've made notes. All of this is very, very important of everything. I want to give you this before we move on. Yeshua said in John chapter 3, 14 through 15, and as Moshe lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, the Son of Man be lifted up. And that's whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, what I want to give you on this, and I'm going to tell you one thing, you guys aren't going to want to click off today because there's still some great things to come. And we're going to go into the, the sign above Yeshua's head. What did that mean? What was that about? Why did that anger so many people? We're going to get in some cool things here. All right. So I want to teach you in something here. We're going to go back to the drawing board because Yeshua was to be lifted up, right? Just like the, the uh, serpent in the wilderness was lifted up. So here we go. Back over. That menorah thing, that is just beautiful. It's beautiful how you get that image in the sheep and the goats. What, what are you? A goat or a sheep, right? We have, you have your life to decide that. So, okay, so the serpent in the wilderness. Now, what had happened here is that the people, for a lack of faith in numbers, they started to, to um, complain and to moan and to gripe, right? So serpents were sent among the people. So here you have the people. Right? And among them, because they're bickering and yelling profanities up at Moshe, at Moshe and basically cursing Yah too. And so you have serpents. Serpents, right? My thing looks like ancient hieroglyphs, doesn't it? So anyway, you have serpents. They're called fiery serpents, and the reason is, is they have venom. And when they would bite, it would hurt. It, venom had the sting. 
And what would happen? You're going to die, right? You're dying if you're bit by these serpents. So the body of the people, and they cry out, and Moshe gets the word from Yahweh, hey, make an image. You're going to have a stake. And on it, you'll have a serpent. And when the people look at this image, they're going to be healed. Here's the thing. The people lost their faith. All right? Yahweh brought in a judgment by them stepping out from under the protection of Yahweh through a lack of faith, through rebellion. They opened up the door for Satan to come in and have destruction among the people. But if they would rekindle their faith and come up, even if they were bitten, so this man, bitten by a serpent, would look upon that which would murder him or cause the death. He looked on the image of that which he feared. The image of what? Death. Death. And when he looked at that image, he would be healed and made whole again. Yeshua says this very thing I must have happen. The Son of Man will be lifted up. That those of us that are bit by the fiery serpents of Hasatan and we're dying, we're all do death. Yeshua took on death that we may live. So we go and we look upon the sacrifice of Yeshua as we are bitten by Hasatan. The serpent. And when we look at Yeshua, what happens in our faith? Such as the man at the stake that looked and said, I believe in you. And Yeshua says, you'll be with me in paradise. The sting of death is removed. Defeated. So when we gaze into that, which we fear, the death, right? When we look deep enough into it, we see the beauty, the resurrection of Messiah. When we die in him, the death, we are resurrected a new creature. We have to die to ourselves. And it can be scary. We can feel like we're going to lose everything. Yeshua said that. You have to forsake all. Lose your entire life. Be resurrected anew. And you'll have life in the next life to come. Death is removed and the venom is removed. And that's where the scripture says that death no longer has its Sting. Death no longer has the venom. The serpent, no longer the venom that would cause death is, we got the antidote. We are healed. We got the anti-venom, right? Yeshua. You see how all this is interconnected? And that's what he meant by lifting him up. You stare, out, you stare at that which you had feared, but in it, you will actually be, receive everlasting life. You fear losing your life. If you would only give up that which you're afraid to lose, you would gain everything. But because you're afraid to lose it, you'll have nothing. If this person was so terrified from the bite of the serpent that was in his body as he hobbled up to look at the other serpent and he goes, oh, another serpent, I'm taking off, man. What would happen? He would have died. It's all about your faith. Glory to the king. All right, so coming back in. Looks like we're all tracking as I'm just glancing in the chat. I see you guys. I see you guys. Glory to the king. And again, if you're coming on to the replay, just go ahead and put your comments into the chat if you would like, and I'll check those out too. So let's get into the sign. All right. Going to have some fun here. Let's see. Here we go. They mocked him, right? They offered him sour wine, which was vinegar, and says, if you are king of the Hudim, save yourself. They're also 
an inscription over him. This is king, the king of the Houdin. One of the criminals, oh, they hanged and they railed him, right? And they went off all those things. But let's get into this. The sign that said, this is king, he is king of the Houdin. I'm going to pull in real quick. We'll go into... I don't want to take us somewhere else here. Let's try this. John 19, 21. See if this works. Let's go to John 19, 21. Okay. Yep. Back up a little bit. I want to give you a little bit more information. So in John 19, 19, it says, Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the stake. It read, Yeshua of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Yeshua was crucified near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Hudim said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Hudim, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Hudim. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Well, now you got to ask yourself, why did they have such a problem with that? They didn't say it had to be taken off completely because they put many of these little messages upon people they impaled. This wasn't something abnormal. And they said, we want you to format it in a different way. We want you to say the same thing. We just want you to say it in a different way. And I would ask myself, why is that? Well, let's go look at the way that Pilate wrote it. Yeshua of Nazareth, Yeshua of the Nazarenes, the king of the Hudim. Back to the drawing board, all right? Here we go. And this is where I need someone to uh, be handling the control panel so I can just run around all day, right? Okay. Back to the drawing board. All right. So let's go with the way this was written. We have the stake. And on it, and I'm going to make it big so we can all see it. It wasn't actually this big. <laughs> this, and we're going to say that this even goes up above it. This is just that plaque, right? This is just the wood in which it was written, okay? Now, we go from left to right in Hebrew, correct? Because it was the Hudims that had a problem with what was written. And it wasn't what was necessarily written. It was the order in which it was written and the way it was said, okay? So, we have Yeshua. In fact, I'm going to make this even bigger. Yeshua, okay, I'm not, right and left to right, it's hard, Nazarene, the king, a little bit more room. The, this is where I should have had this all written out before, right? Wouldn't that have been nice? So there's what you have. And their problem was, we don't like the way that this is worded here, okay? We want to have it been, it said that he's the king, or word it differently. We got a problem with what's being shown, and this is why. Because when you go into the Hebrew, Yeshua, and for all of you that are skilled in writing this, do not be taking me on the chin for this, okay?
The Nazarene The king, this is a long one here. Of the Jews, okay? We see that? Now, what was customary... We see it done in biblical literature. We see other cultures do it. They would do what they call what, seeing what they, they call it acrostics. I had to find that word, acrostics. What's acrostics? Well, in the Hebrew, Yeshua, Haznari, the Kemek, Hahudim, are the actual letters, not full words, that were written on the stake as Yahweh, the Mosaic name given to Elohim. So what they would do, and it was common in their culture, is it would take the first letter, which begins over here, and drop these down. Okay, and I got that, and got that, got that, and then over here. There we have it. And do a little bit of up. Okay, so what do I have written here, guys? We'll go into the Hebrew. Y, H. Now this is also... V in the original, which in English we do a W, but originally Y, V, and then H. Yahovah, Yahweh, all right? Because like we have David is actually spelled Dawid. So we do it as a V when we bring it over into English, okay? So Dawid is David, all right? It was the name of Yahweh that was on there. That's what they had a problem with. That's what they were upset about because on this stake, every Hebrew man would have known you're saying, whoop, did that backwards. When you're going left to right, right? There we go. Which would actually have actually been a V. I'll just put it in its original. V. Yahweh, Yahovah. Now let me prove, show you some more. Okay? So here we go. And also, before I do that, that's this guy. <laughs> Makes it easier, right? But that's what you had up there. That's why they all of a sudden had such a problem with it. Back in. Bring us back on board, pop this off, bring us into this. Let me show you. Here's our John. Oh, I had it on the slide. Look at that, guys. I was prepared. So in Latin, this is done too. I just want to show you, this is something very, very common. This isn't something that, uh, you know, we're just making up today or anything like that. This is actually what they would do. They would take and do these abbreviations for the whole sentence of what was being said. And it was done in their poetic writings and everything. We see it even done in the Latin where the first letters are taken I-N-R-I. And what do you see on many crosses today? I-N-R-I, which is <clears throat> this. Yahweh. But you're seeing it in Latin on all these crosses saying, hey, this is Yah. This is Yah. That's why the Hudim said, hey, it's not so much in what you said, 
It's the way that you're wording it because you're actually making a declaration that he is Yahweh and we can't be having that. And Pilate said, it is what it is. It's what I said it is. I washed my hands of this. His wife had a dream and went to Pilate and she said, do not kill this righteous man. What do you think was communicated in that dream? Huh? Hey, I know it's been studious today. Take a drink of coffee or some green tea or jump up and do some jumping jacks. But some teachings need this. Some are more, hallelujah, but you need this groundwork. You need the groundwork. And you should want this groundwork if you love those scriptures, if you love your king, if you love your people. Don't you want the groundwork and knowing what's going on here? I certainly do. And so, bam, out of that, pop back in. And I'm going to show you this slide too, because it's going to make it, there we go. And there's what I did, right? There's what I did. I just given the opportunity to see that. There we have it. Ooh, getting into the next part. Okay. We're going to land the plane here. All right. So there was an inscription over him. This is the king of the Houdim. One of the criminals hang with them, railed him, right? We saw that. And he says, the other criminal goes, man, do you not fear Elohim? He mocking and stuff. Man, I fear Elohim. And he says, please remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Yeshua says, you will be with me in paradise. Now we're going to Luke 23, 44. It was now about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So that is from when? Noon to three, all right? And we have a solar eclipse, which is spoken of by the prophets that the sun would be darkened and the moon should not give her a light. And how does moon get the light? Well, some believe the moon gives its own light, but we know that the sun reflects, moon. I mean, some of us do. Some of us don't. We're not going to get into that today. But the sun's darkened. The moon's going to be by, by default darkened. And it says that, so that's how you get the dual full prophecy. But while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, thus Yeshua calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And like I showed you before through Josephus, that this is the time at the beginning of the slaughtering of the lambs. They would start it early. They had a lot of lambs to go through. They began to do the slaughtering at the ninth hour of the day. And that Yeshua was taken right at that time. He didn't have to stay on that stake one more second than he needed to. And I love that the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And it says here that when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised Elohim saying, certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breast. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Now, actually, we're not going to finish the entire thing today because I'm going to jump you right over here and show you. When the temple veil tore, what was being said? The spirit of Yahweh no longer dwells in the temple. Now it's going to have a righteous indwelling, which is Yeshua. And through Yeshua, not by our own righteousness, but through Yeshua's righteousness in him, we can also become clean enough to be suitable enough to become dwelling places for the Holy Spirit. And if we believe in Yeshua, he promised you that you would receive the Holy Spirit. You just have to work on getting your flesh out of the way and believing and then you would begin to manifest the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're working on here, right? As a family, as the, the power and the manifestation of the promise that was guaranteed to us, if you truly have faith and if you truly believe. So if you feel you haven't received the Holy Spirit, but you claim Yeshua, pray to have him help you with your faith. Where am I lacking in my faith? Help me believe so I can receive your promise. Because this isn't something we should have to labor for. It's promised, Right? by the labor that Yeshua did, the works that he did, not by our works. And it says in Acts 17, 24, the Elohim who made the world and everything in it, being master of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. This is the thing being communicated. Yah's spirit's no longer in the temple. You can go there customarily for the feast days. Paul even wanted to go back to Jerusalem for the feast days, right? But the spirit of Yah is in the people now. So if the people are there, the spirit of Yah's there, but the spirit of Yah isn't just hanging out in that temple. 
That's not where he placed his name, such as people still today think this. But the veil was torn. The separation was torn. The veil was something that separated the whole of the, the holy of holies, the holy of holies, the most inner place, right? That is separated that where the Ark of the Covenant was and where the Spirit of Yah is. And only the priest could enter and go in there. Only the high priest for our sins. And he only went in once a year. Yeshua through his death, burial, and resurrection rent that veil because he is the veil. Yeshua is the door on which we can enter in. And in him, we can go in and be in the holies of holies in Yeshua. He can carry us in there as the high priest. You see that? So this is beautiful of what's taking place here. And it says in Hebrews 19.21, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places, how? By the blood of Yeshua, the high priest would go in and sprinkle the blood of the lamb for Passover, I mean for uh, atonement, right? In the holy of holies. But now we can enter in by the blood of Yeshua, so you don't need a veil anymore. By the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, since we have a great priest over the house of Yahweh. Glory. Back over. So the, why, how did the, the, the veil rip? Because in the other gospels, it says that there was a great earthquake, which was prophesied by the prophets, right? The sun and the moon would darken and that the earth would quake you know, diverse places, these things would take place, such as in the day of the return of the Son of Man. So here, the earth quaked, and it shifted the where the temple was holding, the great big veil, it shifted. And by it shifting from the earthquake, it tore the veil. So historically, that veil was torn. Now they could say, oh, that was happenstance. Let's just sew up or remake the veil and put a new veil up there. They can go and do that, but the veil was torn as the Spirit of Yah left the, the temple to enter in to the rightful temple. Do we get that one? That's an amazing stuff. So next week, we'll be finishing up our journey through Luke and all that we've been discussing and talking about. And it's been quite the journey, right? As we've been getting everything the way that it's all laid out for us. So, and I thank you all that you've been a part of this journey. And we're going to go on to other biblical lessons as well. But this has been our journey through Luke and we're going to be finishing that next week. So um, go ahead if you have any questions, put them in the comment. And if you're watching this on the replay, absolutely put your questions in the comment. A lot of you have seen that I've went back and caught them. I'm going to say a couple things too as I go down and let me know, Christy, if you see me. Are you on? So um, I'm seeing all the beautiful things in here. Hallelujah. I was once failed and backslide. Yes. Yep. That is so true. Glory to the king. Glory to the king. Price has been pay, paid on the cross, right? Yep. On the stratos. Shabbat shalom. And I see all y'all in here. I love y'all, my brothers and sisters. Bless you so much. And, um, and Brother Mike, I do I want to thank you. So uh, it was received. Much love to you and your house. Appreciate you very, very much. Brother Isaiah, thank you so much. I appreciate your support, Israel. It's only going to go and further the work of the kingdom. Glory, glory, glory. As we go ahead and I'm reading all these. Hallelujah. Who? Potter? Okay, and so the potter and the clay ministry on here, I'm just going to pull this up. She has asked for prayer. It's getting sick and almost passing. It says, but I have a lot of health issues. I have tried, but I have failed to even skip a meal. Oh, okay. 
And so, you, here, take this to her, please. Here. Take that to her. And read me that, Christy. Read me that on um, the Potter and the Clay Ministry. She says, um, her faith is wavering. Please pray for me. I believe it's a woman. Um, and I had told her that I would keep them lifted in prayer, to stay strong in prayer. And I said, for me, listening to praise and worship music helps. It gets me out of my own thoughts. And she said, thank you. I've been doing that. It's like he attacks, the attacks get worse. Suicidal condemnation. At this point, I think I need deliverance. I was washed once, failed, and backslid. Okay. It's been a struggle since. And then, um, you know, some people were commenting to her. Okay. I think um, we got she, enough, don't we? Okay, yeah. She's not. Um, someone had recommended fasting. Yeah. She um, Fasting's good. Yeah, uh, but she struggles because she has some health issues that oh. doesn't allow her really to do that. Perfect. Get it. I'm, I'm online now. So yeah. And then you can press that bottom thing if you want to mute it or I'll just mute it. I just muted it. So anyway, um, with that, if you have health issues and you cannot fast for certain reasons, fast on what you can. All right. Like just taking the bare minimal because you can also fast through the morning and the, and the praying and the crying out to Yahweh. All right. And just kind of limit some things, you know, just, just take it in moderation. You know, you, I think that makes sense, right? So just limit things the best that you can without putting your health in jeopardy. And Yahweh will know the intent of your heart in that. And when you have a great move about to take place in your life, I'll say it like this. You should be concerned when the devil isn't after you, right? You should be concerned when Satan is not trying to get you. Because then... It's at that time, he's just not interested in you, but he wants to fight those that are doing the will of Yahweh, right? That are on the right path. He's coming after them. He's trying to deter them, just like he brought the storm against the boat that the disciples and Yeshua are on going to the other side to cast out a legion of devils. Those devils knew that what Yeshua was come to do. So they affected the weather and there was an unholy storm that tried to prevent the work being done that came against them because they knew that deliverance was coming their way. So in this, in the time of calamities, when you feel like all this is pouring down on you, do as Yeshua did. Find peace in the midst of the storm. It's never going to be easy. You're going to have to pick a moment. You're not going to pray. It's like being brave, right? Bravery is standing up to that which terrifies you. If you're not terrified of it and you go into something, even a battle, that's not being brave or courageous. You're just doing what you do. But when you're afraid to go and you're afraid to take that stand and you do it anyway, that's courage. That's standing in the face of fear. And so in all of this, you're going to have to pick a time, sister, where you stand and you fight. And it needs to be today. And you stand against all that opposition. No matter what comes against you, you stand and you fight. And you know this, there's going to be, and you're right on the borders of a breakthrough. You're crossing that lake. You're crossing the waters to receive deliverance on the other side. You have to stand strong so you can receive your deliverance. So I do like Yeshua said, you will be tried. But I pray right now in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, my sister, that Satan does not overtake you. That you are able to stand against all the opposition that comes over you. And that you receive the deliverance that's going to come on you. We declare it right now in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach this day, this very minute. And that when you overcome and when you persevere, you're going to have a testimony that's going to encourage your brothers and your sisters. So be it. I declare it that day, any health issues, we just come again and we bind and rebuke right now in the name of Yeshua. I bind any dynamic entity that's working and operating in you right now in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that they have no authority over you right now. I command them to leave your body and for you to be at peace and to be set free right now. Any rebellion, I command to come out of you right now in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach.
Any lack of faith, any doubt, the spirit of doubt, I command to come out of you right now in his holy set apart name. I command him to leave you right now, you devil. You come out of that beautiful sister right now. Infirmity, leave right now in the name of Yeshua. Let her be set free. Put your hands up, sister. Put your hands up right now. Receive your healing. Believe, believe this day that you're healed. Believe that you are to be here right now. At this moment, hearing these words that set you free because Yeshua loved you so much that he wants to see you set free right now. He wants that for you in your life right now. But you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to fight for it. I command right now that you are sealed up in his name, that you have the anointing oil just poured over your head and that you're sealed and that anything that's remaining in you is bound right now until their day of visitation when they will soon be cast out as well. And I pray this over your household right now in Jesus name. This is what it's all about. This is called a balanced ministry. You know, you have those that come from like the real in-depth teachings because teaching shepherds, same name, same thing in the Bible, but you have people that lean one way or another. So you have the ones that go into the Greek and the Hebrew and it's, it's fun to do all those things. It helps build an education in your mind of our ancient people. But then that's, they keep going further in that direction. That's all they go. You don't hear them casting out devils. You don't hear them proclaiming the kingdom of Elohim. It's all head knowledge. And then you have those that are very inspirational and very on fire. And it's all of that, but they don't go into the intricacies of the Bible. They don't teach you the the wealth of the word. They stay just on the charismatic side. You need to have a proper balance. Why do one and leave the other undone, right? Right? So that's what I've always been about is balance, balance, balance. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Is that like recent here? Bam, right here. Yeshua said to the thief that, make sure I'm not muted. (laughs) That to the thief that will be with them in paradise that day. Do we have an idea where that may be? The kingdom? That is a question that they have been going over for centuries, my brother. And they were doing this at the time of Yeshua for centuries, trying to answer that question. Because, and again, that's how come you read, even in the Bible, where in one part you're seeing like Lazarus, you know, seeing the rich man over there begging for a drink on the other side of the chasm. They're on Abraham's bosom side, and he's over in the Hades side, right? The holding place of judgment, Sheol. And he desires to even have a drop of water on his tongue. So they had the recognition and they knew each other. And he says, Hey, send him back to my family. Go tell them. And, and Yeshua says, they wouldn't even believe, if, or Abraham in this parable is, they wouldn't believe if even one rose from the dead. So there you could say, well, in the afterlife, they have like recognition of each other and we see all this taking place. So that's what it is right now, right? And then another part, you have Paul talking about like in Thessalonians, them being asleep and they'll be the first one resurrected. And I can take you into verses that say, it's almost like you're in a holding place, but you're asleep. And you can go to other places, no, you're not asleep. So what is it? And, this, and I've done a teaching on this. The way I conclude it, and I'm going to answer it as simply as I can, is that it's like someone, you take two people, right? You take two people, and I'm going to actually do this just real fast. This will be easy. We're going to the drawing board, but it's going to be light. Booyah. All right. So now... You have two people, this guy and this guy, okay? It is 9 o'clock at 9 p.m., okay? This guy here goes to sleep. So we got 9 p.m., and I'm going to go to 6 a.m., 9 p.m., to 6 a.m., okay? This guy stays awake. We got it? So I'll go like that. And this guy's wide awake and a whole bunch of coffee, studying all night long, right? Two people, 9 p.m. to 6 a.m., they do two different things, okay? 
One of them goes to sleep. The other one stays awake. The one that stays awake, this is a long duration. He's reading the word. He can't sleep. He has all these things going on in his mind. He works out a little bit. He goes for a walk. He calls some people in the middle of the night. We all know people that do that kind of stuff, right? So he's doing all these things to get to 6 a.m., okay? And it's been a long journey. Long. This guy goes to sleep at 9, and he wakes up at 6 a.m. So this was like in a twinkling of an eye. He's here in the morning because he was asleep in bed. And it seemed like seconds. We've all had nice, restful, peaceful sleep like that, right? There you have it. There we have the different things in the Bible. Well, hey, they're already with kingdom. They're already with Yeshua at the time of death. They're already with him in his kingdom. You'll be in paradise tonight. Other times you ever read, it's like it takes this long time. Because when you get into the heavenly realms, time doesn't operate like it does here. One day is a thousand years to Messiah. He's light. We do speed of light studies. It's amazing what science has even concluded. If you were to travel at the speed of light, it has a whole different effect on your reality. It throws things off, could go into it, probably bore a lot of you. But Yeshua's light. He does not in the same confines as we are here on earth. We're in a different realm. That's how come Yeshua can speak to a heavenly realm and bid angels to go to do his will and they instantly go and a man's healed. I don't have to make a travel, but here in our realm, if we do it here, we have to get in a vehicle and travel for eight, 17 hours, whatever, to get to a place, to lay hands on somebody. Not that we have to do that, but you know what I mean, to go help somebody. Yeshua says, if you thought like I did, you could declare the heavenlies and wouldn't even need to make the journey. Bam. That's how come a shadow of Peter started to heal people. They started to get that mindset. And you have to, you just can't... Um, think these things and they happen, you have a whole lot of meditation, the righteous kind of meditation that the, they did in the Bible. The dying of self, the building up of the spirit, speaking in tongues to the father to build up that man. That's why I want to get you all on board, speaking in tongues and all of you on board out there with speaking in tongues to build yourself up because your shadow, the shadow of healing people, that was the operation in the heavenly realms. Paul praying over a piece of cloth and sending it and someone touches the cloth, they're healed. He was operating in the heavenly realms. Paul had been to the third heaven. He got to that level. But yet you have all these atheists and people out there, these monks, people of other religions, they practice going into that stage and that area through dynamic spirits all the time. They're all about it. But where are we in this? Do we try to get there? So that's a good message for that. So this guy, it was in an instant. Someone dies today. Someone dies today and Yeshua comes back a hundred years from now, whenever he comes back, it's an instant, bam, they're right there with the, team, the, with the Messiah and the kingdom, instantly. Oh, but that guy's been dead for a hundred years. In your realm, he has been. In the spiritual realm, it was instantaneous. It was as if he was asleep and he wakes. There's Paul's reference in Thessalonians. So these people, like to you, they're sleeping in the grave for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years they're sleeping in the grave, but not in the spiritual realm. They're already with the Messiah in his realm. Quantum physics and all this stuff, secular people are actually getting into this type of mindset and they're learning about what Yeshua was already teaching the ancient people. They're just now with these devils like Hawkins and all these people that are totally antichrist. They're starting to get into this understanding of how these different realms work. I could go on for hours about this, but for the people that's alive, it takes a long time, hundreds of years. I think we got there, right? That makes sense. So anyway, There we go. I know babes are not supposed to teach, but I'm a single woman. What do you think about forsaking all to live the gospel and sharing my testimony and go into the wilderness with Yah with nothing but a bag? Well, now that was called for the disciples because they had a mission to do. 
It was imperative that they get that gospel out because Yeshua's time was coming to an end. It was becoming short. So he said, don't even stop and greet anybody because we kind of miss putting all this in context. He's like, you just keep going down the road because they had customs at that time that it would take a long time to do greetings. And so it was for them to go and carry out this message immediately and to go do a work. Now, I, who am I to say what Yahweh's saying to you? You do what Yahweh's communicating to you and do it to the, the best that you can. Now, I wouldn't suggest as a woman to go out and say street preach. That's not a good idea. That's why men were sent out in the Bible and they went two by two. That's why you, when Yeshua took him to the garden, he says, do you got a couple of swords on you? Because this could go either way here in the garden, right? And they said, yeah, among us 12, we got two swords. He goes, that's good enough. Come on. Just be in that prepared mindset. Things could go away, could go a different way. All right. So I wouldn't encourage you to go out on your own street preaching or anything like that. But if Yahweh has communicated in your spirit to go out and be in a tent or live in the wilderness with nothing but a bag, you know, survivalist living, that type of thing. So you can have a closer relationship, kind of get all the static out of your life. I see that to be a blessing. Definitely let somebody know where you are. And if you don't have anybody in your life, um, you can go ahead and um, email me at teachereric at yahoo.com. So there that, that is, you can hit me up there. Let us know where you're going. <laughs> Let us know where you're going to be. It'd be better if you had people closer to you that you could give coordinates to and let them know where you are at. Take communication devices. So that way, you know, something wouldn't happen to you that you were negligent on and that type of thing. But a lot, what I would kind of feel more for you is again, I don't want to get in the, in the way of what Yahweh has for your life. And, and you will know in talking to him, but get another witness on it. Get somebody that knows you, give them more details other than what you're giving me here. And if you need someone to communicate, email me like I just gave you. I can get you in touch with my wife because we would need more details to, to have a second witness on what you're doing. I, I wouldn't try to go with just one witness on it. Um, I want you to be protected and to be safe. Um, and I think that would answer that question. Yeah. And I, and I guarantee you, you can, I know that we all get real excited when we come into the faith and we should be excited. We want to get that fire, but some of us get a little unbalanced sometimes like I did. Like I came home and threw my wife into a panic because I was throwing everything in our house into the dumpster, like literally everything, clothes, DVDs, music, trashing everything. We're not doing that. I mean, literally from day one to day two, just going woo out there, right? I kind of had to reel it in and bring a balance because instead of dragging her along, I wanted to lead her and I wanted her to follow me. And if I'm not communicating and instructing and showing, how can anybody follow you? So sometimes it's kind of good when you get these messages like this is what you're getting from Yah, pray on it, meditate on it, fast on it, get more than one witness on it and um, just give it some time and make sure you got the clearance in your spirit to do this type of thing. And it's something also you could really just do in your backyard or at a local park and kind of make a transition versus like going out into the national forest or something like that, you know? Um, so the port in which, yes, he did that also when they left the dock and then suddenly they were near the other port, which would have taken them a day's journey. And I may have missed the context of that. The what? Mm, okay. All right. Hey, much love to you Israelites out there. Um, thank you for sharing the, the um, PayPal brother and the, 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 the deal. You can send me letters, you know, drawings your children did, whatever, you know, I like to get those kind of things. I think they're encouraging just to hear from you all sometimes. I mean, this modern day, we've kind of gotten away from snail mail, right? But it, it is kind of nice to have that. So I just make it available for people out there. So I do bless you all in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. And that'll bring today's teaching to a close. So father, I thank you so humbly that you've come before us today, that your spirit enter in and I pray that in all of this that we went through today, that the people out there are able to pull nuggets. And with those nuggets, Father, I just humbly ask that they're able to consume and to eat them and that it would sustain their body, strengthen their body and bring forth a more righteous, a more sound and a more balanced walk in their faith in you.
I ask this of my life, my family's life, and the family of Israel's lives that are here with us today. Where two or more are gathered together, you will be here. So I thank you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. So be it. Hey, I love you all. And you be strong and know for a fact, our King, he is coming.